All right, so we're about to start. I'll hand over to you, Carolyn, to take it away. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Kira Kato, Katoa, Co Carolyn Lundquist, Taco Ingoa. I'm a scientist at NIWA and I have a joint position at the University of Auckland. And it's my privilege today to get to introduce this project to everyone. And we're really thrilled. Um, it looks like we've got amazing attendance today. So that is fantastic. So we hope um, everyone gets a lot out of this. And please do share the video or um, if you enjoyed the, uh, the webinar, please do feel free to pass on contact details um, when it comes through of the links when it comes up on YouTube. Um, so what we'll be doing today is we're going to start with me just giving a bit of background on um, sustainable seas case studies and how these come about and kind of the key things that make this a really fantastic case study for the challenge in um, enhancing ecosystem-based management. And then I'll hand over to uh, Becky and Anna, and they'll be talking about the Hawke's Bay Marine and Coastal Group, as well as a regional council perspective on what this co collaboration means for Hawke's Bay itself. And then the real meat of the presentation will hand over to Justin, and he'll take us on this journey that we've been going through over the last year on using systems thinking and developing the systems map with our stakeholder group in the Hawke's Bay. Uh, and then we'll get some chance for questions. So we're looking forward to um, answering your questions in a hopefully not too brief Q&A. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so why Hawks Bay? So um, most of you, I'm assuming, have heard of Sustainable Seas. This is one of the national science challenges. We have just started this year our second phase. So it's a total of a 10-year program. And one of the great things that's been a big focus in the second phase is doing quite a bit more on implementing or using these real world, world case studies of ecosystem-based management. So for us, the Hawks Bay um, partnership started um, actually two or three years ago where we had a meeting between the leadership team and the Hawks Bay Marine and Coastal Stakeholder Group. And we basically sat down and came up with that we had very, very much shared objectives on where the stakeholder group wanted to go to, but particularly of interest was that there was already an existing group of people with shared objectives for restoring the health of the Hawks Bay. So with that, then that meant there was already a connection to existing data and knowledge to inform the case study and just really a great opportunity to be able to trial the EBM tools that had already been developed by the challenge. Next. So, what is ecosystem-based management? This is probably old news for most of you, but basically we were trying to make sure that um, this case study was really focusing on these key principles that have been identified by the um, National Science Challenge leadership. And I'll just point out a couple of these that really fit in quite well to what we're working through within the Sustainable Seas Hawks Bay case study, the first one being collaborative decision making. So this is really a partnership between the challenge researchers, between the Hawks Bay uh, Coastal Stakeholder Group and with the Regional Council on what can we do together to uh, implement EBM or enhance the chance that uh, EBM is implemented. It's also very much tailored. This is a Hawks Bay case study. This is not something that's meant for everywhere. It's very much taking in that place specific and um, all those aspects of the Hawks Bay that make it a very wonderful and exciting place to work. You can probably see the picture in my background. That's just us um, in Ahuribi Estuary with the marina right there. But it is a beautiful place to work and it has been identified as somewhere that everyone wants to make sure it's sustained into the future, both for um, the beauty and the nature that's there, but also the livelihoods that are supported by the marine ecosystems. And finally, uh, this key thing that it's very knowledge based in terms of our case study that we have a lot of information that already exists or has been compiled by Hawks Bay uh, Marine and Coastal Group through the work that they've pushed forward so that there's a lot for us to build on both our uh, science information, but also Mataranga Maori through um, lots of um, iwi focused projects. Next. So in terms of the timeline on where are we, well, our journey is about halfway through. And so we'll be presenting what we did in the first year of this case study. Again, as Charlotte mentioned, looking at two different stressors. And Justin will be introducing the systems mapping work that we've done and also the data compilation that we've done to see what information do we have that already exists in the challenge that we can use or in the challenge area. And then, um, 
Anna will be introduced briefly then where we're going from here. So what our next step is that's starting uh, over the next 12 to 18 months on using tools that have been developed by the challenge. Uh, so I'll hand over now to uh, Becky. Kia ora. So I just wanted to um, put this slide up to highlight the complex sort of legislative, le legislative space in the coastal marine area. So if you look at the top of the slide, you can see the, um, the number of different acts that are you know, involved in managing the coastal space. And oftentimes these acts are implemented by different agencies. So not only does that highlight the complexity of management, but also that it's in order to effectively manage, you wanna have multiple people in the room having the conversation as opposed to just one agency. Next. So in 2016, the Hawks Bay Marine and Coast Group formed over perceived depletion of inshore fin fish stocks and environmental degradation in Hawks Bay. The um, group membership has evolved since the group was initially formed, um, but you can see um, it includes groups that all are, that have a vested interest in coastal management in Hawks Bay. And that includes, as mentioned before, government agencies, but also Tunga Te Whenua, private companies, um, commercial and recreational fishing interests. And the group is not a decision mandated group, but rather the group um, wants to collate information and present information to guide good management practices. And they've met regularly since their formation in 2016. Next. In 2018, the group co-developed the research roadmap. So in the research roadmap, they define their vision, which is to achieve a healthy and functioning marine ecosystem in Hawks Bay that supports an abundant and sustainable fishery. Not unlike the sustainable seas objective, if, uh, if you know what that is, but also the research roadmap outlined research outputs that are necessary to, for some good management interventions that could be implemented in the Hawks Bay marine environment. So Carolyn's spoken about why Hawke's Bay was considered an attractive partner for sustainable seas in this process, but why did uh, Hawke's Bay want to partner with sustainable seas? We had a willing group who had the social investment and collaborative group and the desire to see improvement in our marine space. We also had a collaboratively designed research framework that enabled us to pool our resources. But we didn't really know what came after that. How could we tie all these pieces of research together to understand the interaction of these multiple stresses and what management intervention, interventions could or should be undertaken uh, in what order, at what scale, in order to actually make this change and reach our objective for the marine space. And this is where the interface between the Sustainable Seas Challenge and the Hawke's Bay Marine Coast Group uh, best benefited from the tools and techniques that were developed in phase one of the challenge. So what we're aiming to do is take our current understanding and desires for the marine space and turn them into some of the management scenarios that we can develop collaboratively through HB Mac and are evidence-based and tailored for the Hawke's Bay, East, uh, Hawke's Bay Marine area. Next. One of the major issues that we're dealing with is not only is our ecological system complex and varies both spatially and temporally, but our social system is highly reliant on our connection and access to our marine space. Here I've got examples of some of this complexity. On the left, we've got a Bayesian network that was um, used to demonstrate state in some of the Hawke's Bay estuaries. And you can see all those nodes moving in and out of each other. And it just demonstrates the complex nature from one attribute to, a, to an actual state or an outcome. And on the right, we've got a um, the myriad of legislative and strategic documents that are required in terms of actually just looking at one estuary in particular. And this is from a recent report undertaken by the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment managing our estuaries. So there's all that, those complexities and dealing with those in a multi-stressor, multi-sectoral environment where values can be um, highly, highly emotive, highly driven and sometimes conflicting can be challenging and requires a technique which exposes this complexity and exposes some of these uh, conflicts with an aim to resolve them. And this is where Justin comes in. 
Kia ora koutou. Ko Justin Connolly, Koko Ingwa. I am here to talk about two things today. I'm going to give a, I need to give you a quick crash course in what systems thinking is or how it has been applied in this instance. And then I'll talk about how we use that in this Hawke's Bay case study. So first of all, what is systems thinking? System, systems is a word we hear a lot and, and many people think, think systemically. It's a very, uh, I like to say, broad tent of ways of approaching how we think about systems. To, to be clear on uh, the the background that we come from for this perspective. The tool that I will describe here comes specifically from a discipline called system dynamics. Um, and so that's just putting it in that broader context. Neither is better nor worse. It's just one way of thinking about systems. The second thing I want to say is that everybody in this webinar already knows a huge amount about systems, right? We live, work, play, and we're embedded in parts of many systems all around us. So these tools aren't intended necessarily to to tell you stuff that you already know about the systems you live or work in, um, rather view them as accessible tools with which uh, you can use to get an alternative perspective on the systems of interest to you. So what is a system? Well, I like to use the words of um, a woman called Danella Meadows, who many of you may be familiar with. She says a system is a, co a collection of things, cells, molecules, humans, or whatever, interconnected in such a way that they are presenting in some kind of behavior over time. So interconnections and behavior. These are the two core things I will come back to um, in this little quick little crash course. So by understanding and articulating the way that things are interconnected, that's what we call this system map. And I mean it in map in a conceptual term, not a physical map sense. We can better understand um, why causes are interacting to present in behaviors over time. And based on that, we can better understand where in that system to intervene or take action in order to change those behaviors to more desirable types of behaviors in the future. Uh, I will articulate very quickly a, a tool for helping to understand systems, which are called systems thinking iceberg. Now, you know, you know, you know the iceberg analogy, there's a bit above the water you can see, and there's a whole heap below the water, which is hidden. And we have events, trends, system structure, and underlying perceptions and values. Now, the deeper down this iceberg we go, the greater leverage we have for influencing or changing the system or interest. At the very top are events. Now, these are discrete um, things in, in isolation or, or viewed in isolation that are happening. Um, they, they, they often tend to be our problems that we hear about in, in work or in the media. And when we just view them as unconnected things, all we can really do is react to those. The first step in systems thinking is to start to view these things as a trend over time, right? Do we have a decreasing frequency of something or is it, is it an increasing amount of something? Or perhaps it's a consistent behavior around something despite various uh, attempts to intervene to change that. So when we better understand in terms of a trend, we're better able to predict where we're heading or where we might be heading. This next step, this third layer is where most of this presentation is orientated. And it's about system structure. So that's, these are these conceptual system maps we talk about. What are the set of interconnected influences and drivers, cause and effect, which are causing those behaviors? When we better understand that as best we can, we better understand why those trends are occurring and therefore where to take action. And those are a pathway to greater conversations about um, airing our deeper perceptions or values, right? Systems. Uh, are often not intentionally set up to produce the behaviors that they do. We don't societally set up a system that creates some of the bad outcomes we see, but they are the result of either natural or socioeconomic things into play. So some of that is influenced by perceptions and values. What's the benefits of systems thinking? Well, it's problem-oriented analysis. Uh, it helps us understand why, not just when stuff might happen. And it's, it's about synthesis. So it's about stepping up and going wider uh, to help connect all these various areas of deep analysis that we have great information about. So it's a useful tool in conjunction with other analytical tools. It's very, it can be very participatory as we have used it here. It can help identify who to involve as well as actually be a vehicle for them being involved. And it can help build consensus or support for the course of action moving forward. It's not necessarily a method for predicting or forecasting specific results. And this is a, a subtle difference between projecting exactly when something might occur, occur as to understanding the trend we're heading and whether that's the trend we want to head in as well. And it's not a magic bullet for all problems. So it's useful for some things, but not for everything. 
So back to the system structure layer in the iceberg. Uh, there's three main components in the systems thinking world that create system structure, that make up system structure. Feedback or circular causality, delays and accumulation. And I'll just cover those real quickly in this crash course. So feedback is circular causality. In this image at the top, you can see perhaps a linear um, series of causality. We have a something where a goal we want to be or a situation we want to be at uh, compared to our current situation. And there might be a difference between the two. That's a problem that leads to decisions and actions and we get some kind of results. All done and dusted, move on to the next problem. Now that is a valid way of looking at the world. Uh, I prefer the bottom way where it's uh, circular. And again, we have an aspirational or a desired uh, place and our current situation and the imbalance between those causes uh, different types of decisions and actions to occur, which gets results, which affects our current situation. So even if we get back into balance in certain things, that cause and effect relationship still exists, even if it lies dormant for a spell. Two basic building blocks, a reinforcing loop and a balancing loop. These are common across other scientific areas, of course, but uh, the reinforcing loop is a uh, where some kind of condition reinforces prompt some kind of action which reinforces on the condition again. So perhaps you know, money accumulating in a bank account is a simple example of compounding interest. Whoosh, up it will go. And a balancing feedback loop is where you have a condition that prompts some kind of action that cancels out or balances that original condition again. And so perhaps a simple example is a thermostat there. Uh, you might have a cold room, which prompts heating to come on, which heats up the room, which prompts heating to go off, which then the room will cool down, so on and so forth. So a, a goal seeking or um, oscillating type behavior. Now delays are simply this uh, difference in time between cause and effect, and they vary. Uh, if you were to hire a new person, it might take them a few months to get used to the systems. Uh, if you were to go and study, you might take you a couple of years to get a degree. If you're growing a crop, it might take you a year. If you're growing trees, that might take you decades. Uh, if you're retiring land, that obviously is um, very, fairly indefinite. But, a lot, but definitely decades before it, the benefits of it kick in. And the bottom right there, uh, just an example of sort of yellow for nitrogen, brown for sediment and orange for phosphorus. So perhaps some kind of activity in terms of nutrients where um, they all happen at the same time, but sediment and phosphorus might present in waterways much quicker and nitrogen's um, a bit slower through the groundwater. And accumulation, I always like to joke that we're simple folks in the systems thinking world. So I like to use simple analogies, but powerful analogies. And I always use this example of the bathtub. So the bathtub is where stuff accumulates. Just think of it as an analogy for talking about where stuff builds up or declines. So perhaps we have a declining level of morale in, uh, you know, in your company or something, or an increasing level of uh, contaminants or something, whatever it is. That's the level of the bathtub going up and down. And that's the graphs or behaviors over time we are interested in. Uh, stuff gets into the bath through a tap, it comes out through a drain. That will become more a little more obvious later on, but I'll just connect those things via a simple example real quickly, and I like to use non-controversial examples, so let's talk about traffic. Uh, if we had traffic congestion, uh, that's going to, this is a linear way of looking at a traffic congestion problem. You have traffic congestion that leads to frustration and pressure to build more load roads or lanes. We're going to build another lane, it's going to decrease traffic congestion. Problem solved, move to uh, another traffic congestion issue. This is one way of looking at that issue. It is not the only. The trend would probably look like that and get a bit worse before you build the road and then it can drop down. A circular way of looking at that same issue is to recognize that traffic congestion leads to frustration and pressure uh, to build highways, which then do create uh, reduced traffic congestion as you get dropped off there. Those cause and effect connections remain though, they just perhaps lie dormant or less powerful for a while. At the same time, uh, there's a greater attractiveness of outlying areas. If there's less traffic congestion, you probably end up with more people living there eventually, and that leads to more commuters, and you guessed it, that leads to more traffic again. So this is the type of intervention, uh, type of insight we can get from um, systems thinking, even though this is simplistic. It's the, that the very intervention intended to solve the problem actually could cancel it out or potentially even make it worse. Now, if those continue, you might end up with some kind of trend like you see there. So how did we use this in the Hawke's Bay? So we built this picture of system structure, these system maps, conceptual maps, not geographic maps, to understand stressor behavior in the Hawke's Bay. Now, there's two points I want to make here. And the first is that uh, we use this 
at all as a very participatory process. So the HPMAC group was obviously highly involved. Uh, they contributed all the knowledge. Um, and we worked with them to reflect back a system structure which uh, brought uh, together all of those perspectives. So I just want to recognize that it is, um, was a very participatory approach. Most of this presentation, however, will focus on the output, which was the system structure that we articulated, right? And that's where I'll spend most of, my, most of the rest of the time. I'm gonna put it up now, and it is all loops and arrows and words that you, like you see there. So it may look a little bit overwhelming, but the intent of this slide is to not so that you can read this in detail, if you do want to explore it, and I I'm hope that you do, uh, it is available for download on the Sustainable Seas website. But broadly, I'd just like you to recognize that it, there's lots of loops going on there, right? So there's not just things pointing in, everything is sort of interconnected and flowing backwards and forwards and around amongst each other. On the left, we have some very land-based activities and influences onto uh, the brown box, which is freshwater sediments, one of our main stress source. And then in the center there, we have uh, loops around benthic structure, which is the blue box. And on the right, uh, obviously influences and loops around marine-based activities as well. I want to take a moment to explain some of the part in the middle here in a little more detail, just to demonstrate how the tool um, is used. Uh, but again, I, we don't have time to go through the entire thing. Um, so I'll just go on this bit. So starting with these two main stress stores. So we have freshwater sediments. Uh, so the freshwater sediments in the freshwater column, basically, uh, and benthic structure, a generic term for all, to, to capture all types of benthic structure because this map is a lens through which to look at different geographical issues. So coming back to that conceptual map versus geographic map can be used in conjunction with different geographical areas and perhaps just different loops dominate depending on the situation. You will recognize here perhaps that the way that those are structured look a little bit like a bathtub. These arrows in are the way that both sediment gets into freshwater column and new benthic structure contributed or comes into the the stock of benthic structure that exists and the drain out the bottom in terms of sediment settling out of the water column or benthic structure being uh, removed or um, smothered. So articulating, going to the next step then and starting to connect how these things are interconnected uh, at, a, at a, remember at a broader level and obviously there's lots of detail in each of these areas, but we have uh, the greater the amount of freshwater sediments in the water column getting out into the marine area, the greater the marine suspended sediment. Uh, the greater marine suspended sediment there is, the greater the deposited sediment there will end up being. And uh, depending on the relationship with currents and tides and waves and the, and the amount of water energy, um, perhaps that deposited sediment could be uh, redisturbed back into suspended sediment again, or the energy keeps that as suspended sediment and stops it settling out. So there's a little bit of a vicious cycle immediately there in terms of how those two things interact. The more deposited sediment there is, the greater potential for the smothering of benthic structure, and the greater suspended sediment, the greater the turbidity, and the greater deposited sediment and turbidity, the lower the benthic recovery rate of, of whatever type of benthic structure that might be. These next series of loops describe uh, a, a, a way of synthesizing a number of relationships around the uh, regeneration of benthic structure. So here, these two nodes, if you can see my arrow uh, cursor, hopefully, this appropriate level of benthic structure just recognizes sort of that aspirational or desired or necessary level. This doesn't predetermine uh, of benthic structure. This does not predetermine what that level would be. Uh, this is just an, an agnostic tool for saying, okay, this is where it should be or, or we want it to be. And this is where it is currently in terms of our current situation. If there's a little bit of a difference, so perhaps if this is a bit lower than that, uh, this line here will probably dominate in the first instance because that's sort of the natural path for benthic recovery. There's a little bit, little bit less, it will sort of naturally regenerate and get, come back into balance. Uh, at the same time, if that's a little bit um, low, there's, there's obviously other organisms and critters that are associated with benthic structure that are part of the wider ecology. Um, so the lower that, uh, the, if there's a bit of a difference, then there's probably less of those. And so that might affect the benthic recovery rate, so, which may then be an opposite influence on that uh, new benthic structure coming in. So immediately a quick couple of uh, articulations of uh, potential conflicting loops of causality. The, if that difference was to get perhaps too great and it got to a deficit type scenario, a large deficit type scenario, then perhaps we're closer to a likelihood of crossing, 
crossing some kind of recovery threshold and that's probably going to decrease the ability of natural benthic recovery so less of that uh, going into the stock and perhaps in some places around the country that's uh, what's going on currently and the benthic uh, structure difference perhaps if that's too out of kilter we've got this human benthic restoration action and so perhaps there's this uh, this other pathway of human activity seeding some initial benthic structure in, in, in attempts to help that grow or regenerate uh, to get it back to a point where these other loops start to come back into play. And of course down the bottom here in terms of benthic structure being removed that sort of dealt mostly with benthic structure regenerating um, a lot of any kind of bottom, bottom contact was likely to disrupt um, benthic structure on the seafloor. So we've got different types of dredging, port and shellfish potentially, uh, cable laying activities and uh, trawling bottom contact from fishing activity. And of course we have the frequency and intensity of weather events as well and they will be influenced by climate change. So the, the more, more of those the greater the water energy, uh, potentially the greater destruction of benthic structure full stop and over time potentially changes in ocean pH and ocean temperature. So quite a lot of detail in all of those little areas but hopefully you can get the sense of how these loops work together to describe these broader tensions and these loops of causality where these things are going um, that we are interested in and which ones dominate. So back to our overall picture again I'll just scan through from this from left to right and a little a little closer so you can see it uh, sort of land-based activities here uh, through to stuff in the center which is the ocean sort of benthic stuff and then through to the right hand side where we have quite a uh, huge amount of marine based activity stuff going on. What this process highlighted was there were some main areas uh, of imbalance in this wider system. A couple obviously, well, um, many of them we sort of already knew about, but it helped to articulate how they were connected. These freshwater sediments, obviously we're at a high level benthic structure, was at a low level. Uh, this, this lack of connection or loss of connection uh, with Tangaroa and uh, an imbalance in public satisfaction with ecosystem health. And that's probably both, both land-based and marine-based as well. So how did we use that? Um, how do we use these maps to explore pathways to the future uh, for some of those imbalances? So this is where the systems mapping can be used as a, um, as a fast track way of exploring possible futures. So what we did was, um, it, you know, we built this wonderful articulation of interconnections and that's great. And it's normally when people go like, so what? And we go, okay, cool, let's reconnect that with our behaviors and trends over time again. Now this is where it can work hand in hand with more detailed modeling. Um, this is, we used a very subjective, qualitative and participatory process to try to articulate what some of those future trends might be. And you'll see marbles in front of you here. Uh, that's exactly correct, the correct slide. So it was very much this uh, participatory modeling. We call it analog simulation, but basically use it laying out our map going, okay, these are our starting conditions for where we are now. And, the range of interconnections that we have articulated as a group, uh, what are our base conditions, and then if we if we carried on as per normal, what would that look like, and if we took different scenario interventions, what would that look like? So a very subjective approach, but, but like I said, a fast track way of articulating futures. This is the sort of thing that comes out of that. This is a baseline uh, you know, carry on as per normal approach. You'll, you'll notice that, uh, so we assumed no particular different activity than what currently is going on, but uh, different activities in terms of freshwater management and the NPS and so forth um, coming into play. You will notice that, uh, you know, we, we would assume that some activities, you know, even though there's a lot going on, still gonna take a little while before they kick in. The trends might continue to get worse, this one being freshwater sediments, um, until they plateau before they can start to head in the right direction. And deposit a sediment out in the bay, I see that might decrease at a lesser rate, but it's still going to accumulate because it's not really going anywhere immediately. And particularly, um, so, so the delays before stuff starts to change direction in terms of trends and the size of trends were insightful. So these other lines down here are around cultural identity, community well-being, um, community fisher satisfaction, that sort of stuff, probably taking longer before they start trending in the right direction. And so really highlighting some of the delays inherent in the system. This was um, 
an attempt at a, a potential sort of hypothetical scenario. I should stress that this is no actual scenarios were um, tested yet. That's kind of the next steps and Anna will talk about that in a bit. But this was just to, this was to demonstrate the use of the tool after we had constructed this wonderful series of interconnected knowledge. And so sediments continue to probably increase before they get better and then decline. This was a uh, muscle seeding um, attempt. Leave it for a little while so that some of the fresh water can uh, the, some of the freshwater policies can come into effect and then seed some mussels in a particularly sedimenty turbid area. Perhaps that's not particularly successful to begin with, but then every 10 years or so look at upping that. Just a hypothetical way of exploring, like a quick fire way of exploring potential futures. So to have perhaps inform scenarios for discussion or for further modeling or um, for the insights that these provide. We also supplemented that with what we called a knowledge stock take, which was um, looking at our overall system diagram again and uh, heat map or kind of recognizing where we had knowledge to be able to draw on if we were going to have these conversations in the future. Now we didn't access this information, this was a desktop exercise in terms of tabulating what information is available and there's, and there's lots of information available in lots of different places. It could be scientific information, it could be Mataoranga based information, it could be anecdotal um, and so forth. And so uh, the, the red numbers here are just cross references with that table in the report, but the, the important thing to note here is the colours in terms of dark green is reasonably robust and um, good information, yellows perhaps a medium amount and some of the oranges less so. And I'll just scroll through that from left to right as well so you can see some of those colours um, and some of the areas of that, that they cover. So that's uh, the end of my part. I'm sorry if I've talked rather fast, hopefully that has been um, uh, not too fast to understand and I'll now hand back to Anna to talk through next steps. So the next steps that we're looking to undertake over the next 12 to 18 months is to co-develop some of those scenarios with the Hawke's Bay Marine and Coast Group. Um, these may include things like looking at some active restoration projects that the mussel bed example was a good one, uh, reducing some of the sediment inputs from some of the major river systems or reducing bottom contact in some areas. Once these are decided, we'll run them through one of the tools that was developed in phase one of the challenge, the degradation and recovery model. Now this will use uh, data held by a number of the Hawke's Bay Marine and Coast Group partners, including things like seafloor characteristics, ecological communities, trawl data, um, and look at how functional groups change over time according to disturbance. Once we've run these scenarios through, we've gone back to the group and brought it back through model, tweaked the model, come back out through, we'll look at it again through the lens of that systems map. And the reason for doing that is to look at how it changes We've called them goal gaps in the slide. Um, it's called imbalance or how it changes the difference between the current and desired state. Um, and whether there's any consequences of these actions. The benefit of looking at using the socio-ecological space is that we actually get to identify some of the interactions that we may not have predicted. And Justin used a good example of the traffic management. Although there may be a, an immediate um, relief, um, using that circular approach, we actually say, well, actually, there are some ongoing uh, interactions that we didn't predict, which actually further exacerbate the issue. Now, the last part of this diagram in the labelled four, we've actually greyed out. This isn't part of the current stage two Hawke's Bay case study project, but we've highlighted it as being a really important part of the um, overall success of, of using the ecosystem based model. And it's actually talking about once we've run this through the systems map, through that socio-ecological uh, framework, how do we navigate um, those areas where there may be conflicting values or where people are reluctant to make decisions based on a level of risk or perceived risk or a level of uncertainty. Um, so hopefully this is the next stage of the project and we're looking at some of the outcomes that are being produced by Sustainable Seas Challenge and other projects. We'll be looking at that really closely. So thank you so much for joining us today and we're happy to take any questions. All right, thank you so much, all four of you. That was incredible. Uh, just, it's amazing to see all the different connections being made by those systems maps and also the connections made between the 
Sustainable Seas and HB Mac and all the other people involved. It's um, a pretty awesome collaboration. All right, so I'm going to kickstart the Q&A session with a question about systems mapping. So you mapped two marine stresses, but uh, I'm sure there's more. Um, what other marine stresses could be mapped? That's right, um, Charlotte. There are obviously multiple stresses in the marine space, uh, similar to any part of New Zealand. The reason that we picked those two stresses to concentrate on was to keep um, that map and to keep the process somewhat um, confined so that we could work it through thoroughly. And I think um, Councillor Neil Curtin has asked a question earlier on in the chat as well around things like contaminants. And that was also discussed as part of the HB Mac. Um, conversations around the systems map. So there are certainly more stresses that we could include into that systems map approach. Um, this is just, just an example of how two of them could be chosen. And part of that was because of the fact that we were trying to bridge the gap between Resource Management Act, Fisheries Act. So we chose two examples that were based within each of those or, or managed by each of those. When we get further down the line, we can probably include more of the stresses within that Resource Management Act framework, more of the stresses within that, um, that Fisheries Act or the Department of Conservation Act. That could be something that is looked at in terms of that benthic structure protection sort of side of things. So as Becky mentioned earlier, there are a lot of acts that need to, we need representation from all groups with a similar outcome um, focus to, in order to actually enable or make some of those changes towards more ecosystem based management. Can I just add to that too, Anna? Um, I mean, great points you make, thank you. And the from the system um, process side of things as well, uh, one of the things that, you know, I have uh, I have learned from, from myself in the past that people often also struggle with when getting introduced to systems theory is that uh, you can run off and sort of draw interconnections through everything in the whole world because everything is connected. So the um, articulating a, a, a few stressors or whatever it is that you're trying to understand those trends of behavior helps uh, guide the conversation and that you're unpacking and, and discussing. So um, it's uh, so it can it can be wider, obviously, than perhaps a narrow conversation might normally have, but it's just to be careful not to fall into the trap of uh, trying to map the entire world because that can be very, very challenging. So perhaps um, what you might do is also map a number of stresses in the different systems that produce them and then look at those and how they overlap, the commonalities of areas that overlap. Awesome. Thank you both Anna and Justin for that answer. Uh, I have first question from Neil. Should Napier City Council and Hastings District Council also be stakeholders given the respective city's impact on the coast? Right. And, and yes, certainly in some regards, um, Napier City and Hastings District are and will always be stakeholders within the space. Uh, Hawke's Bay Marine and Coast Group was originally formed around uh, the fisheries abundance side of things and ecosystem. And as I said, trying to bridge that gap between the Resource Management Act and the Fisheries Act in terms of impacts on the on the marine space. Um, when we, if we were looking at the contaminants that are liable from urban settings, et cetera, or municipal waste discharges, et cetera, then certainly they'd be in that picture. And also when, uh, as Becky mentioned earlier, Hawke's Bay Marine and Coast Group is not a mandated decision-making group. So if this goes to a stakeholder consultation where we start to talk about the potential management interventions, then that would be certainly um, the time. Thanks, Anna. Uh, next question is from Jane. Are there any specific restoration projects being discussed based on current knowledge? I'll take that one again. <laughs> um, so absolutely, one of the restoration projects that we are looking at is um, the Wairoa Hard. This is an area of foul or cobble ground that is um, spans over 300 square kilometres uh, in the northern part of Hawke Bay. It was closed to the fishery in 1981 uh, because of the, of the um, bottom contact issues that it had. Uh, we are aware that Back then it had dense macroalgal stands in there and so one of the things that we're looking at or hoping to look at possibly in the future is uh, why the dent, those dense macroalgal be um, beds haven't 
come back, even though there's been a lack of bottom contact. So we may look to potentially restore or seed macroalgae in that space if the light availability is appropriate um, and see how that goes. Uh, the other one, obviously, that we've sort of discussed, but it, it's not, it's only in infancy, is whether uh, muscle bed restoration, which is happening elsewhere around the country, uh, is something that we could look at here as well. Awesome. Thanks again, Anna. All right. So the next question is from Zamina. I hope you, I said your name right. Using the systems-based management that has been described here, what are some of the steps that could be taken to begin identifying problem hotspots in a coastal river that leads to the sea by a community-based group that is working on taking care of the local awa? Great question. I'll jump in and um, answer that one. So yeah, excellent question, thank you. And so this refers back to the point I made around um, using a conceptual map in conjunction with a you know, physical or geographic space. So it would be more probably because you're talking about land-based or hotspots um, in terms of the coastal rivers, uh, looking, at that, you know, looking at the systems map in terms of the land-based loops on the left, um, seeing which ones of those are perhaps more active or more dominant in that particular geographic space um, and working from there. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. All right. Next up, we have Brianna King. What is the approach slash process for teasing out perceived trends to actual trends? Where are perceived versus actual trends defined? Another yep. excellent question. And, yeah, Tanakwe um, Brianna. Uh, so yeah, so the that depends really a bit on the information feeding into the process. Like some some information sources will have clearly defined trends, and uh, depending on the type of knowledge informing that trend, um, and others will only ever be anecdotal or perceived. And so. Um, this tool allows us to con explore connections between um, things that are, you know, able, perhaps able to be measured and perhaps not able to be measured. It's, it's probably a key point in terms of um, how this tool uh, can be used. Um, in terms of how, oops, sorry, wrong slide. Oh, that's not good, is it? <laughs> Forgive me. Um, I... Justin, while you find your slide, maybe I'll just jump in yeah, and, jump in, and yeah. say certainly trends are, um, are, are a very difficult thing to try and determine, particularly when most of our environmental data is fairly young, maybe up to 20 years old. Um, I think one of the difficulties is, although we can determine trends, uh, baseline is obviously another state that we, we really struggle to define and we struggle to identify what is an appropriate baseline. But I think the majority um, of that, you can also look at that in terms of our social um, license or how we um, how we operate within the space. And, and the analogy I use to that is, is um, people's people how people view things changes over time five years ago we would never have sort of thought that single-use plastic bags would have been banned from the New Zealand um, space but it has so people change very rapidly and even if trends aren't detected in that what is considered acceptable to our communities may change over time so we need to always couch things in terms of our the, the social acceptance as well. But what we do in terms of trend testing is try to identify um, any variability outside of, uh, outside of um, the natural variability or the direction or trajectory that that change is, is occurring in. Back to you, Justin, if you've found your slide. I have found the slide, thank you. I'm not having a very good IT day, sorry about that. Um, yeah, the, the other comment I wanted to make on that was the, the last point around, um, that was in that question, you know, what are perceived versus actual trends, and that sort of starts to step into that lower layer of the systems iceberg, which I talked about before, we've articulated system structure, and then there's like perceived um, underlying perceptions and values, and so, you know, the term act, actual trends, like actual according to what, according to scientific data, or according to lived experience, or according to experiential um, you know, and knowledge as well. So 
that's uh, probably the other component that comes into play there. It's not entirely a, um, a hard measuring sort of tool. If that, if that helps answer your question. And I think it's also a, a great segue to what we'll be doing in phase two, because a lot of what we're using with the sustainable seas tools is we can actually develop these scenarios and look at whether using models that depict these different ecological processes, um, for example, on effects of uh, benthic seafloor disturbance or on sedimentation processes, we can then look at what does the ecology say in terms of what that recovery process should be and then compare that to what data we do have, recognizing we can't go back with the baseline data that we have. We can't go back for 50 years, but we can use the models to explore what we think might have happened and see if that does reflect the information we do have. Awesome. Thank you all for that answer. Next up, we have a question from Rhiannon. Are there any plans to make these systems thinking maps more dynamic or integration with spatial information? Yeah, I'll um, answer that in the first instance and others might like to contribute after. So, uh, so again, I just want to pick up, I think I've part answered this question in response to the earlier question around the land-based um, sort of hotspot rivers. Um, in terms of more dynamic, so again, coming back to this, the interpretation of systems thinking where this, these tools come from, system dynamics, obviously that's in the name, so it's all about um, the dynamics or the change over time. So hence, from my, my view, it definitely is about dynamics because it's about those trends over time, linking structure to trends. The spatial information, less so, but I think I addressed that uh, more earlier, right? Like if that, that speaks a bit to the uh, scale of application that you are looking um, at applying things for. If you are wanting to look at a particular catchment or particular local geographic area, you can um, align those conceptual connections and causality with that space. Uh, but also just always remember, right, there's probably other causal areas, uh, causal influences from outside that area and causal influences that might not be tied to specific uh, spatial places. So it's probably always gonna be a um, intuitive combination of both. I hope that answers your question, at least in part. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Doesn't sound like it. So we'll go on to the next question, uh, which is from Neil again. Are we in the position to know how close we are to a threshold for collapse of our inshore fisheries from the various stresses? Um, part of that is, is based on that divide between Fisheries Act and RMA. So this is where this project is trying to um, bring those two sort of areas together. Um, I think our colleagues at Fisheries NZ would be much better placed to answer that, but we can certainly have a, have a chat about that at another time. And can I just add to that as well, because that's also a question which highlights uh, a point I made earlier around using these system maps to understand causality, as uh, less so perhaps to predict exactly when. There's other tools that might predict exactly what level of threshold might need to be before that is um, going in the wrong direction, before it tips in the wrong direction. And this tool helps us understand the causality which is causing that behaviour to get there. Not, not necessarily in a physical sense, but the socio-ecological drivers that might be contributing to that happening. So I think the combo of those tools helps um, understand that, but this tool won't answer that specific question. Great, thanks for clarifying that, Justin. All right, next question is from Jacqueline. Is anything similar being done or planned for Te Whanganui Atara Wellington Harbour? Uh, well, this case study is obviously for the Hawke's Bay, um, but I, I, I think it would be a very useful tool to explore um, in Wellington as well. Our emails are there, contact us. Just on that note, uh, Jacqueline, we have uh, case studies um, as part of the research theme. Um, currently, we have case studies in Hawke's Bay and also, I think, Marlborough at this stage from Sustainable Seas. All right, so next question is from Tom Belford. Uh, Hawke's Bay Regional Council is expending heaps of energy and money convincing farmers their soil loss is harming the bay. But how far away are we from actually documenting that damage? 
and the degree to which their land use versus natural erosion is causing the problem? Kia Tom. Um, it's a really good question and certainly we have quite a lot of uh, literature both nationally and internationally talking about sediment loss, particularly from the New Zealand landscape and how it has changed over time. Part of the reason um, that we have done that uh, or particularly within this project, one of the reasons that we've actually brought our land scientist here at Hawke's Bay Regional Council, Dr Barry Lynch, into the project is to help us with exactly those sorts of questions. And um, not within this project, but externally through core business at Hawke's Bay Regional Council, Dr Lynch has been um, looking at sediment loss through modelling using Sednet, and it certainly is uh, dependent on different catchments, but an averaging of around 200% more than pre-European levels. Um, uh, certainly you can speak to Dr Lynch uh, more about that via, you can contact me. Um, we are also undertaking, uh, separate to this project and as part of core business with and, and aligned with the HBMAC, uh, uh, multi-beam eco surveys with Niwa and MPI um, and that's looking at how much of our seafloor is being impacted by soft sediments. Um, they will be going somewhere, part of the um, part of the work that we're doing and I think Ted Conroy is, is on this webinar series. He is a PhD student at the University of Waikato and he has been charged with looking at developing a hydrodynamic model that also couples sediment delivery so that we can actually understand a bit more about the source, transport and fate of some of these soft sediments. Awesome, great answer, thank you. All right, next up from Joe. Are there any plans for community slash public engagement or formal education on this project to enhance the divide or fill the silos between science and community knowledge? That's actually from Amy. Great question, Amy. And who wants to take this? Maybe Becky or Anna, you could take this on behalf of how HBMAC engages with the more general public in Hawke's Bay. Um, well, I think I think the fact that Hawke's Bay Marine and Coast Group it's it's not um, community community or public engagement, but it is it covers such a range of users of the marine space um, that I, I'm, I'm hopeful that each one of us takes it out to our networks and helps to deliver that information and knowledge outside of it. Um, I, yeah, I'm not 100% sure how to answer that question apart from um, just saying that we try to uh, do these webinars, we try to um, deliver council papers, et cetera, and try to put it out put out there and, and hope people ask questions exactly like this <laughs> and come along to these webinars um, because, it, because the information that we're putting out at the moment is talking about how how these structures or systems operate. One of the key things that we get is um, an expectation that A plus B equals a particular outcome. And sometimes in the natural environment, it doesn't work quite that quite that um, linearly. So, so we certainly, that's part of the community or public engagement that we try to um, try to discuss is the complexity around how systems um, will will react to certain scenarios. The other thing is obviously we're trying to reach a particular outcome and a lot of time we get comment around, well, we know what's happening. Why don't we just get on and, and, and get it done? And to a degree that's right. Um, we know some of what's happening, but we don't necessarily understand all the interactions and all the interrelated um, nodes that are working together. And this is what this project will help us try to develop a bit better understanding about is where we can invest our energy to achieve that outcome because there's nothing worse than than doing something and it not getting to where you want to go. I might just add also to that that um, part of the next you know in the phase two bit of the project that we've talked about is navigating through some of the competing values through the systems map. And at that stage, that could be an opportunity for us to engage with the wider community outside of just the HBMAC group to get a bit more of a diverse sense of opinions and values and interests that we're addressing with some of the model results that we've seen. 
And I, I think Charlotte also put up on the list, we do have um, on the Sustainable Seas website, there's a link to this project so you can see both if you're into that kind of stuff, we've got even the contract details of the proposal and what we're doing, as well as um, this rather long report on the systems mapping process, a picture of the systems map if you want to zoom in and see all the little loops and all of the different detail that's in there. So we've got a lot in there as well as our contact details that are up now, but also on the web page. So please do contact us and we're happy to come up with further ways to engage and share uh, the information. Awesome. Thank you for that question, Amy. I've also seen your comment about um, or extending an olive branch of maybe helping with that education slash engagement at the National Aquarium of New Zealand, which is on Marine Parade. I'm just going to, um, it's now 12 p.m. and I just want to um, thank everyone for being here. It is the end of the session. However, there are still a few questions to go through. So if the speakers are comfortable, um, we can stay for another max 15 minutes and I'll continue asking those questions. Yeah, that's great. In particular, I'd quite like to get to that next one first, so that if people want to hang on a moment. All right. Okay. Narratives, because I think that's quite an important question. Awesome. Okay. I'm just going through. So this next question comes from Shade. Uh, have you encountered difficulties in mapping interactions as a result of the different narratives that group members ascribe to? How do you address these, if so? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll attempt to answer this. And, and Tanakwe Shade, um, good to see you're on. Uh, absolutely is the short answer. So um, everybody has different narratives, different perspectives. Uh, and this tool is about trying to broaden the group perspective as much as possible, um, the shared perspective that everybody, uh, I guess, brings or operates in. Um, I don't claim that this tool would uh, perfectly represent any one particular um, narrative or perspective. Um, so how do we how do we address these? If so, I guess we look for the uh, greatest commonality in terms of um, understanding those broader pressures. It comes back to the loops, I guess, in terms of the, the causal drivers in terms of the loops, where we can, um, the, the dis and again, you're talking about that sort of system structure and perceptions and values part of the iceberg analogy that I was talking about earlier. So by articulating those cause and effect, we're slowly unpacking or, um, you know, inadvertently uh, helping people understand the different perspectives and stuff that people have. So it's um, hopefully that's an attempt to answer your question, but I would say that it, yes, it does happen. Um, there isn't always a perfect answer, but it's about explaining it best from a shared perspective so that we can navigate forward as best we can. And if anybody else wants to comment on that, please do. Speakers, do I have any any anyone else wanting to answer Shade's question? No, I think I think Justin explained it quite well. Certainly, um, everyone in the group has their own perspective, their own um, also mandated areas that they will naturally, um, and we ask that people people bring those to the table because that is the the true nature of collaboration and the true um, uh, benefit that we're going to get from working in the collaborative space. Thanks Anna. All right next question is from Kimberly who has unfortunately had to leave but I'll still ask her question so she can watch it later. Her question is is this related to DPSIR slash PSR? I'm assuming the speakers will understand what that is. Can you repeat that acronym? <laughs> sure, the acronym is DPSIR or PSR. I'm assuming pressure state response models. Um, <laughs> sorry, it took me a while. Um, it is related to that. Uh, certainly, you know, the map in itself um, naturally aligns with that. The pressure is in terms of things like land-based impacts, uh, land-based activities that may increase sediment. Um, the state being the um, the state 
of the benthic structure or the state of the marine um, suspended sediment levels and it, the response in terms of some of those areas. I think the thing that the map does it actually it branches out a lot more and it includes those social ecological um, connections. Um, and I think later on the question is asked around were there anything that was surprising? And I think um, it wasn't necessarily or it shouldn't have been surprising for me, but certainly it highlighted areas that I wouldn't have considered naturally, um, uh, particularly around um, in that fishing space that I'm less familiar with. Um, so, so it does come from that pressure state response kind of um, area, I would say, and Justin can, can jump in after this, but it does have all those feedback mechanisms and the hysteresis, the delays, um, the oscillation or the accumulation, as well as those social aspects. Uh, yeah, I, I would just I can kind of concur with what Anna's already said. Um, I'm not particularly familiar with the other sort of um, pressure state response. Um, approach, but from what I know about it, it's not dissimilar to the uh, the types of causality and circular causality that's being described here, because these circular loops of causality are in themselves um, pressures and states and responses, all in one sort of, uh, often all in one loop or in a series of interconnected loops. So it's a sympathetic way of um, perhaps approaching or analysing a, 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 within a similar sort of framework. Yeah, and I'll put up a link, hopefully I'll, I'll find it um, from the Sustainable Seas website. One of the projects that we had in the first phase um, was a project looking at how we manage for cumulative effects that um, a lot of their work was directly based on the DIPSER framework. So, um, but that had kind of the creation, you know, one of the outputs was the Aotearoa cumulative effects or the ACE framework on, you know, what are kind of those building blocks that we need to do both in collaboration and sharing knowledge and in understanding how these different stressors interact that, you know, what are the building blocks that we need to do to be able to address cumulative effects in the marine environment. Can I just come back to, um, I'm not sure if Anna, you started answering that question around surprising interactions. Um, Charlotte, was that the one you're about to ask next? Yes, I was going to um, just read out the question so it's on the record um, from Pete, so I'll just ask it. Have there been any surprising interactions that the systems-based approach has identified that would otherwise have been missed during a typical environmental data-driven approach? Uh, again, I'll attempt a, a first answer at this. Um, the short answer is is probably more in the re, in the realm of um, the surprises have been around the delays and the actual interconnected the broad interconnectedness of stuff so the um, environmental data driven approach um, is obviously a valuable contributor of knowledge uh, and in terms of perhaps not surprising interactions but per surprising insights uh, usually tend to be that a, the most high leverage intervention area is probably not the most proximal to where the issue is. I'd say that's a common insight for our systems thinking type work. So, if, you know, if it's like stream bank erosion, you harden the stream bank, it's sort of a very um, data and response driven approach, but there's bigger issues going on with say stream bank erosion or whatever the issue might be. So if that's um, a, my, my attempt to uh, respond to your question there in terms of, it's not specifically about the interactions, but the, the the width or breadth by which all those interactions are connected and often um, it's you know, it's not linear, it's not just fixed and it'll be solved, it actually just sort of brings something back into balance for a little bit of time maybe, but the fundamental driver will remain. And Justin, if I can just jump in as well, using your um, example of the stream bank erosion, I think the thing um, for me was coming back and, and pulling that back even, is, you, you know, a step further and a step further where you have community expectation um, that that water is put away from assets. So there is a, a requirement from our communities that, that water is moved away from infrastructure, which leads to these sort of dug channels which leads to stream bank erosion if you then um, cement the sides to prevent stream bank erosion you don't get the settling so you get more increased sediments um, climate change of course is going to have a an impact on the number and frequency of the events that we see so all of these things and, it, and again it's coming back to rather I think this picks up Justin you're quite right about that proximity 
relationship um, that A, B doesn't necessarily make C. You know, you may have to move all the way to T to, to actually um, find something that won't cause those unpredicted consequences going forward. I just wanted to point out, I think the thing that I thought broadly across the entire suite of participants that people really picked up on, and a lot of it probably comes from having that bathtub analogy, that those timelines and hysteresis, I, I don't think, or probably everyone was, but hadn't explicitly come up with that way of thinking about, you know, sediments as a stressor that it's not just something we can turn off the tap. We do have these historical effects of sediments, of fishing, um, and these are things that are actually, you know, something that we can't just turn off a switch and then everything will come back to normal, that we do have these time lags in there. And I think the whole systems map and the approach we did, and particularly the, the marble exercise we did, really helped everybody put that into perspective of, you know, decisions that we make now probably aren't going to have this fantastic result in a year. It might take a decade or multiple decades, but, you know, that's, you know, decision making now, you know, really needs to happen in order to create those things for the future that we can't just keep waiting and piling things on. Yeah, I agree. I'll just say for my perspective that I, um, when we did the marble exercise to see the flow on effects from seemingly dis simple decisions of, oh, we'll just stop all the sediment, turn that tap off, problem solved. But then actually working all the way through was really enlightening to see, well, actually, if we do that, there's going to be impacts in other places that we hadn't really considered before, especially in a wider community context. And I think that was really enlightening. Great, thank you all for answering that. We have uh, five more minutes left. And I actually had a question for all four of you. It's more about the logistics of the map itself. If I was, uh, you know, it's available on the website now um, as a PDF. If I was a community group, could I just print out the map and start using it at meetings to help discussions? Or is there some stuff I need to know before I do that? Oh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, I'll begin with the answering this. So, um, this, to, to answer your question is, this is why I sort of gave this little crash course uh, in this presentation, like this is how the systems thinking works. The, the contextual answer I will provide is that um, whilst it is just arrows and words and sort of nodes and loops, it looks really simple and straightforward. Of course, it's a bit of an art as well as a science. So um, having an understanding of what some of those, you know, core loops that you're looking for, some of the ways that they interact um, is really important. The a loop could change from sort of reinforcing to balancing depending on how you articulate it or describe it. So there is a bit of nuance as to how it gets applied, just like any sort of um, approach. The, so that's sort of the contextual setting. The, um, the, the immediate response is please download it, have a look, familiarize yourself with the types of loops and dynamics that we have articulated in this. And also recognize that this was described in particular in relation to uh, the Hawke's Bay. Now, many of, many of the fundamental um, loops will probably look similar in different, in different areas, but I just caution against sort of going, oh, let's take this one and do it over here, whatever that other place might be. But um, uh, so, yes, yeah, so I guess in terms of fundamentally, it's, it's the loops and the, and the behaviours that you're sort of looking to draw um, insight or inspiration from. Does that help answer that question? Yes, what I'm hearing is... Um proceed with caution, knowing that it's tailored to Hawke's Bay. And I know on the website, there are some kind of, uh, there's some information on instructions on how to sort of read a systems map that Justin has written. So um, thank you for that. I am going to wrap up now because it's nearly time to finish. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to all four of you for doing this presentation. It has been amazing. Um, I've learned so much about this project and it's pretty awesome to see the amazing collaboration that's been going on as part of this process. One thing I really enjoyed was um, you mentioned the systems map can be a participatory tool, but also the process is a, of creating that map is a participatory process. And I think it's really clear from your presentation just how many different people and groups are all involved and, and different inputs as well. So um, 
thank you for that. Um, I just would like to remind everyone that this has been recorded and this link uh, to the recording will be available on the project webpage. It will also be sent around to all registrants as well. So you, you, will, you will have this recording. Um, and last but not least, I just want to let everyone know that um, the next webinar in our webinar series will be in February 2021. The, it is about the results of our Tidal Current Energy Project, uh, looking at a case study here in um, Te Whanganui Atara of Cape Terafiti. So that is also available uh, for sign up on our website as well. So thank you everyone and have a great summer. <laughs>